Quick warning, some content in this video may be sensitive to some viewers, and of course, viewer discretion is advised. Enjoy. This story takes place when I was in college a couple of years ago. I was away from home for most of the year on campus, and I didn't have much going on in my social life. I didn't really socialize, and I wasn't doing much in ways of partying or hanging out with anyone else. Through most of my college life, I only had one real friend, Charles. Charles was a techie. He was all about the newest trends and technology, and he was always willing to discuss the newest topic if you had an interest. Since I really only had Charles, and I couldn't see my family or friends at home, I would sometimes get to a point where I was really lonely, and I was feeling like there was no one around to talk to. Yes, cell phones are a thing, and they were, and I could have just called my family at any time, but honestly, there's something about seeing the face of those you love that just makes it more personal, and makes it feel more connected. Maybe it's just me, but I sometimes feel like I need to see someone's face to know that they're really there. Anyways, there was one day where I mentioned this to my dad, that I was feeling a bit down about having not seen them for a couple months, and he decided to take it upon himself to send me a fancy webcam, so that we could start doing video chatting. I was honestly ecstatic about the idea, and I actually joked about how that was something I should have thought of. He ends up going to a local tech store, and he buys this really nice HD Logitech webcam, I have no idea how much he ended up spending on it, but it was a really good quality camera. As soon as I got it, I set it up and I got it all running, and then I got on a video call with my mom and dad. I was legitimately excited to have it, and I really felt like this was going to be the solution to my socialization issues for sure. For a month or two, everything went pretty normal with it and the camera itself, or at least how it worked, isn't the focus of this story. The camera itself was a really good piece of hardware. The image was crystal clear, and it was really easy to use. Unfortunately, it being a good piece of technology meant that Charles liked it as well. A long story short with that, Charles was wanting to start a YouTube channel where he went down internet rabbit holes and solved those weird mysteries on the web. Think people like Frederick Knudsen or Nightmind and such, but more dedicated to those weird 4chan mysteries. Basically, he asked me if he could use my computer to record himself for his videos, and in return, he said he would be my on-call tech support. I didn't really care about the tech support, and while it was a little weird to have him in my dorm room, I didn't mind it. For the most part, he would text me when he wanted to record, and I would go for a walk, go get food, or work on homework in the commons area of the university. This deal went on for a couple weeks, two or three at most, and he recorded at least five or six times during this time frame. I watched his first few videos, and they were actually pretty decent. Good, interesting information that was presented in a clean way. He had one on some missing girl that some people on 4chan were talking about that was really well done, and then he had one that explained parts of, uh, of the deep and dark web, I found it a bit strange when he didn't even bother to ask to use my computer that next week, but I also thought that maybe he was busy with classwork. Then, when the next Monday rolled around and he didn't have class, and he didn't call me, I messaged him to ask him what was up. He told me that he just wasn't feeling up to doing anything on his channel. 
I again thought that was odd, but I didn't really push it. I just kind of told him that whenever he was wanting to do more work, to let me know. What got strange for me was that, after that, he seemed to not really want to talk to me anymore. Then, there was something that happened that legitimately scared the hell out of me. There was one night that I was having a lot of trouble sleeping, and I was feeling incredibly restless. I was pretty much just lying there and staring at the wall, and then I rolled over and looked at my computer. At first, I didn't notice anything, other than the dark screen and the window behind the monitor. Then, after a couple of seconds of just staring, something about the scene was bothering me. Then, it clicked. My screen was off, sure, but I had left the tower on. Now, this is something that I do every once in a while, but then my eyes moved over, and I noticed that the red light on the webcam was blinking. This light only blinks when the camera is in use, and I hadn't used the camera at all that day. I sat up, I started to shift out of my bed, and then I noticed that the light on the camera shut off. My groggy brain struggled with the situation, but I decided to get up and just unplug the camera, then try to go to sleep, which did not quite work. Things got even worse the next day, when I needed to get on my computer to do some classwork. It was early in the afternoon when I was back in my dorm room. I turned it on to do a report, when I noticed that... There was a document on my desktop that was titled, Read Me Please. I hesitantly clicked on it, and then read what it said. Hello, Michael. Please, don't unplug the webcam tonight. I like watching you while you sleep. I'm not doing anything bad with the footage. I promise. It was literally two sentences, and it made me want to puke as I read it. I immediately disconnected my computer from the internet and called Charles, demanding he come over to help figure out what the hell was going on with this. He was hesitant at first, he told me he was busy with something else, but I told him that my computer had been compromised and that I needed his help immediately. When I said that, he changed his tune. When he got to my room, I found out why he changed his tune. He explained to me that when he was doing research for his dark web video, he had to go out onto the dark web. He said that while he was doing so, he did come across a few sites that were sketchy, but he tried to avoid anything that was too questionable. That is, until he came across a website that required you to accept a prompt to access it. He said that it looked reasonable, and it just said that you accepted their terms and whatnot. But when he clicked on it, the computer locked up and it looked like someone else had connected to the computer. Apparently he watched as someone else got into my system, and basically did whatever the hell they wanted. And then he didn't tell me. He said he was pretty sure they had disconnected and that they hadn't done anything to the computer because part of the agreement page said they would not use my information for malicious purposes. He said this as if I hadn't just told him that this person was remotely accessing my computer to watch me sleep and as if hackers on the dark web have a code of conduct. I may have gone off on him telling him that it was the dumbest thing he could have done, and that he needed to fix the problem right then and there. I told him that he needed to get all of my files off the system, and then wipe it, or else I would make his life hell. A threat that I have literally no idea how I would have followed through on, but thankfully Charles was a bit timid and he agreed that he would help me. Obviously this was a few years ago and I'm no longer on the campus, and I'm pretty sure that guy never got onto my system again after that. 
despite this, I have literally never slept with a computer in the same room since. And I've always made sure to turn off my computer when I'm done using it. Every night. Hey everyone, I wanted to post this story up in hopes of explaining some of the horrors you can actually find on the dark web. Honestly, most of the things you find on the dark web aren't actually the horror movie cliche laden websites that everyone seems to think they are. Most of the dark web is questionable or illegal adult content. People trying to buy medications illegally, things like that. If you're wanting something like what you see in the movies, you have to actually know where to look, as in have the onion link. I'm not saying that those things don't exist, they just aren't easily or readily available. A lot of people tend to think that there's some sort of dark version of Google where you can search for crazy stuff and be given a handful of results within a few moments. That's really not how it works. Anyways, that out of the way. I wanted to talk about a dark web experience that was honestly horrifying for my friends and I. This was several years ago. I think we were 16 or 17 at the time, and we thought we were super hackers. I know it sounds stupid, but the three of us were all about the nerdy crap, Python, networking, and again, quote unquote, hacking. I'll spare myself the embarrassment of explaining all that. Just know that we knew our way around a computer. Naturally, the three of us gravitated towards places like Reddit and then 4chan and such. I don't remember where we heard about the dark web, probably from a friend, the news, or on one of those aforementioned websites. But when we learned about the difference between surface web and dark web, our curiosity was piqued. We started looking into what it was what was out there, and what we could do. Of course, we were enchanted with the hacker haven that it was glorified to be, and we thought we would get on there, look at some of the questionable sites, and be the coolest kids in high school because we had accessed content that other people didn't know existed. So, we did what we had to do. We loaded up Tor, got information on some onion links, and got ready to have our minds blown. Of course, it ended up not being as interesting as we thought it was going to be. The sites were plain, bland. We saw a couple sites selling pills and others that we didn't even bother scrolling through because of the front page. There were also a few adult-oriented webcam sites that honestly we weren't even interested in. I think all of us were getting a bit disappointed in what we were finding, though I don't know what we were expecting to find really. I think we just kind of started clicking through and going anywhere and everywhere we could get into. Looking back, that was a really stupid idea. After clicking around for a while, we ended up on a page that looked a little flashier than the others. I can't remember the name of the page, but I think it was something along the lines of Your Choice, or something like that. As we started on the home screen, the whole page looked like it was a site for a butcher shop. There were a number of pictures of meat slices and cuts all over the front of it. It explained the quality and what seasoning to use with each piece. It even went as far as telling you how to determine whether or not your cut of meat was choice, high quality, or basically lower end. Unfortunately, I think you can all see where this is going. We ended up on a page with a list of cuts and each of them had a diagram of a person next to it. The part where the meat came from was highlighted. Some of what was on that page was horrendously graphic, so I won't explain it in the story, but you can imagine what all was there. One of the most disturbing parts of this website was its explanation on its sourcing. If I recall, it explained that all of the packaging would be discreet, and they would include their own seasoning packets that could go best with whatever you chose. And what's even worse, 
they explained that all of their meat was fresh and sourced on demand. They touted the fact that they had the ability to get everything when it was ordered. Obviously, we were freaked out by seeing this... this kind of... meat. We got off the site, and pretty much immediately removed Tor. We all kept up our pursuits into the IT world, sure, but... I don't think any of us have ever been back to the dark web. I want to preface this story by saying that if you have any curiosity about the deep and or dark web, just get rid of it right now. If you're an everyday user and aren't in the know of how onion routing encryption, VPNs, etc. work, then use the stories like this one to satiate your curiosity. Do not start down that rabbit hole, and don't dig any deeper than you need to. That said, let's get into some backstory. I'm a tech nerd. 100%. I'm the type of person that was ripping apart old PCs in the 80s and putting them back together just to see what worked with what. Mind you, that was back when I was a kid. Now, I learned about all the tech back then, and I took that passion deep into my adulthood. So, now, I work in IT, if that wasn't obvious. And I know a lot about what goes on out there on the net. Now, that's all well and good, but that's all surface web and surface tech level stuff question from here quickly becomes, how does me being a geek equal dark web horror story? Simple. I've been there. In fact, I've been there probably more than many of the stories that you've heard on this channel and many others out there. I've seen quite a bit, and maybe I'll give you a few more stories in the future, but this one is one that I think is worth telling. Mostly because it was honestly terrifying. Back when I was on the dark web frequently, there was one site that I used to always venture towards. Obviously, I'm not naming that site because, as far as I know, it's still out there. It still exists. This site was, I don't know, kind of like a dark web bazaar. You could buy pretty much anything and everything you could really want, and it wasn't terribly expensive. I used to buy things from there that were less than legal, and I even used to occasionally sell some stuff that was also less than legal. Honestly, this site had everything. Substances, weapons, pirated DVDs, stolen goods. If you wanted it, you could find it there. The dealers had their ratings that would pretty much tell you how reputable they were, and the higher the rating, the better the overall service or quality of what you've ordered. Think eBay ratings, but for drugs and other illegal stuff. One day, and one conversation, sticks in my mind as probably the most memorable thing that ever happened while I was on the dark web, and on this particular sales site. I was browsing some of the content, simply for the hell of it, seeing what was out there and what I may have wanted to blow my money on, and I saw an entry that I thought was a bit strange. Girlfriend for sale. Honestly, I thought it was a joke. Maybe someone was selling their old silicone sex doll and wanted to have an eye-catching title. I went to the page and scrolled down to the description, and it didn't help any more than the title. It simply said, Selling my old girlfriend, message for details. At this point, I felt quite compelled to message this person, so I did. And here is how the conversation went. Me, hey, I wanted to ask about your girlfriend for sale. Him, alright, what do you want to know? Me, pretty much everything. Him, alright. She's 27, a bit on the thicker side. She has black hair, green eyes, freckles. There was more information that he included here. 
He used other words to describe her body type, gave exact measurements, and went into a bit of personal details on her and what she would do for me. I'm not going to put them here as I want to keep this story out of the graphic territory. After he told me all this, I obviously knew that this wasn't a sex doll he was selling. He was legitimately trying to sell a real person. I wasn't sure what to do or say at this point, so I simply said, go on. Him. Would you like to see her? It may make it easier to see if you're really interested. Me. Okay. And I wish I hadn't done that. He then sent me a few pictures of this woman, tied up and gagged in a basement. She looked exactly like he had explained. Her wrists were bound with duct tape, and she had a chain around her neck that looked to be connected to a concrete pillar in the center of the basement. The look on her face was one of legitimate terror. You could tell that she had been crying excessively, her skin was dirty, and her hair was a mess. He then uh, sent me photos of her in what I will simply describe as compromising situations and positions. I'm, again, not getting into the details, but honestly, it made me want to vomit. When I clicked on this entry on the site, I was kind of expecting it to be a joke, but these pictures and what he had told me had me pretty certain that this was absolutely real and that scared the hell out of me. Then, he sent me another message. I have one interested buyer that's currently offering 70k cash by the end of next week. If you can get me at least 75, she's yours. I was beyond shocked that the only thing I could think to do was ask what her name was. To which he replied, Oh, sorry, I can't give out her name in case you would do something stupid, like try to find her or contact the police. I replied with, oh, no, I wouldn't dare. I was just curious. His response to that chilled me even further to the bone. Good, because it wouldn't matter. There's no one around that'll miss her, and on paper, she's been dead for a month. I do what I can to make my transactions stress-free. That includes my prospective buyers. I expect them to keep things stress-free for me. So please... Don't do anything stupid. He compounded this last sentence with a smiley face emoticon, which honestly actually added to the threat. I honestly had no idea what to say. I didn't know if this was legitimate or some kind of honeypot seller trying to arrest human traffickers. I just told him that I would try to get the money together and if he didn't hear from me by the time the other seller came through, that was okay by me. I didn't want to raise any alarms with this guy, regardless of who he really was. I really don't have much more to say about this story, other than to say that I have no idea what happened to her or the seller. I didn't follow up, and I just kind of let the situation go. I know, this makes me a shitty person and I've honestly lost sleep over it, but I'm more hopeful that it was just a honeypot, and that he was trying to lure me into doing something illegal so that I could be arrested, more than being some guy that was actually trying to sell his girlfriend. The story is related to one that you've told in the past. You could see it as a continuation or addition to it. I'm not the author of that story, but I've had a similar experience. The story in question is the one you mentioned, I think, back in your first dark web video about the kids that ended up on the human meat shop. If any one of you don't recall the story, first off, you should go listen to the video but it was about a group of kids who were messing around with the dark web 
and ended up on a butchery site that listed human meat and explained how to properly prepare it. They advertised their special seasonings and gave all the information about the specific human cuts. They also touted that they sourced on demand, meaning they had the ability to get the meat when you requested it. So they had it on standby, and then they would kill and cut it when you wanted it. Kind of like Wendy's fresh, never frozen promise, but for cannibals. Yeah, it was legitimately creepy stuff. And what's even worse, it's legitimate. I can actually vouch for the legitimacy of the human meat market. I don't know about that specific page they were on, it could have been a honeypot, who knows, but there are a handful of actual pages that you can work with to get human cuts. I've actually spoken with people that claim to have eaten human meat on the dark web, and they've told me it tastes close to veal, but depending on the person's fitness level, can also taste closer to pork. I don't know about you, but that thought makes me gag and kind of want to become a vegan. That said, I actually had a bit of a story about another dark website that was similar, but took it a bit further in their intentions. I'm not going to name the page. I don't want you listeners going out there and becoming man-eaters. Plus, it's super illegal to buy human meat. Duh. But there was, and probably still is, a dark website out there that is dedicated to cannibalism, but they see it as more of a religious experience than anything. You heard that right. They see the practice of cannibalism as a religious experience. This group of people that are on this page firmly believe that loving thy neighbor is not enough. You should also gnaw on their shins with a bit of sweet baby rays. Sorry, bad joke. Humor aside, I am being completely serious. The site was built by a group of people, a cult, if you will, that hold a firm belief that the ultimate act a human can perform to get closer to God is to consume their fellow man. Their ethos basically states that eating human meat can cause a change in your biology and would make you more than human. It said something about how it was basically the way to climb up the food chain and that the only thing above humans were gods. Thus, being more than human made you godlike. I remember reading a lot of their information and just thinking, wow, these people are completely and totally insane, but they definitely held tight to their own beliefs, and they didn't shy away from what they thought. Like I said, this was pretty obviously a cult, and it used all of the expected cult language, pushing you to become more than what you are talking about how their leader was given this message from God himself, and trying to gather more members through their positive reinforcements of their ideologies. They had a section where you could actually sign up for a meeting to come and see what their group was about, which, to me, felt more like a method of getting more victims, but maybe they were legitimately recruiting people. Much like the other page, they had all the basics, how to prepare the meats, what flavors went best with what parts, how to safely eat your human meat, which is an interesting thought. There was even an entire section of the page dedicated to their members and rankings. It included their favorite activities. It was honestly like an icebreaker page that was made to show you that everyday people were also willing to eat other everyday people. Overall, this was a 10 out of 10 on my WTF meter, and if I disappear after sending you this story, you'll know what happened. I'll just hope they pair me with a nice salad to balance out the meal. My dark web story is one that actually happened recently, within the last four or five months, actually, and it's one of the most disturbing and sickening things that I have ever seen 
or experienced in my 32 years of being on this earth. There are some really sick people out there, and I want to say to those of you listening, stay off the dark web. Enjoy the stories told by those of us who are stupid enough to get involved in it, but don't get curious enough to drag yourself into the mud. Like most people, living in this quarantine has left me with an excessive amount of spare time on my hands. I am still employed, thankfully, but I get to work from the comfort of my living room. I'm not going to name my employer or my job title for obvious security reasons, but I will say that I'm pretty much the guy on the network team that gets to sit at home and watch data traffic spikes for the company's applications and websites. To be honest, I probably have one of the easiest jobs out there. I get to watch a graphing system as it shows how much data our servers are pushing and receiving, and unless we get hit with the denial of service attack, there's not really much to be done. If anything does happen, I get to get on the phone and talk with the other networking guys about what actions we want to take. Then, I have a weekly report call with my boss to tell her that everything is working as intended. We aren't a huge company, and we upgraded our servers at the end of last year, which was perfect timing, so there's honestly not a whole lot to do on the day-to-day. -day. My job is more reactive versus proactive. Based on what I just said, you can probably assume that I know my way around a computer. I've been in IT my whole career, and I like to believe that I can hold my own out there. I know how networks run, I understand data routing, and I know a lot about data encryption and security. During the start of quarantine, I started studying more about data security and such, and I ended up being interested in Tor, onion routing, and how the deep web and dark web differ from the surface web. If you really want something intriguing to read, take the time to look into the Marianas web. It's an interesting rabbit hole, even though it may not even exist. Now, as most technically adapted people do, I got both bored and curious about what existed out there in the deeper parts of the internet. I didn't want to do anything illegal, but part of me wanted to be familiar with what content and activities existed below the surface. I know, this sounds stupid, but boredom and extra time can be a terrifying motivator when you kind of know what you're doing. I went through the process of setting up my personal system to get on the deep web. I installed Tails, set up Tor, I got a decent VPN after doing some vetting, and did all my security checks. I started going through some of the Onion links that were easily accessible. For the most part, they were innocent sites that really didn't have anything crazy on them. I was simply perusing the pages, not getting heavily involved. I found a lot of what you would expect to find. Adult content, a few illegal shop sites, various conspiracy boards and other forums. Just some basic deep web content that didn't really stand out, and probably wouldn't be too far out of place on the surface web. But then? Then I ended up on a page that I never would have expected to see on the deep web. A dating site. I say dating site, but based on the explanation of their services and some of the profiles, I think it was meant to be more like Tinder, one night stand interactions with little to no commitment. What I found was that the dating page was set up in what I can only call categories. Basically it was split out into what you were looking for in a partner. It had categories for race, ethnicity, background, sexual preferences, personal kinks, and even a section that was basically for sugar daddies. If you don't know what that is, I'm not going to explain it to you. While browsing, one of the categories under the personal kinks section made me curious, as it was something I really wasn't sure about. It was simply labeled chasers. I clicked on it and decided I would spend a few minutes looking through the profiles, 
I was bored and curious. What I ended up finding was nothing short of legitimately terrifying. The profile I clicked on was of a middle-aged guy. He was fairly attractive and looked like someone that would do well on any of the normal dating apps. I was reading through who he was, trying to figure out what the hell made him a chaser, and when I got to the bottom of his profile, it read the following. I'm looking for anyone that can help me achieve my lifelong dream of being physical with an HIV-infected individual. This entire section further outlined how it was his goal to catch the disease and that he was willing to pay almost any amount to do this. And I went to another profile, and it was a young man that explained that he had been infected with COVID and that he would be willing to give it to anyone that wanted it for the price of a nice dinner. He made sure to outline that he was just tested positive and that time was of the essence if you were interested. The third profile I went to was looking for someone to hurt or severely injure them while being intimate, and I'm not even going to explain the specifics of what he wanted or was asking for, but that person definitely needed to seek help. This entire category was of people looking to catch diseases or give diseases to each other, and a few that were looking to be injured. A lot of them were willing to pay for these services, saying that it was a deeply embedded fantasy of theirs. I think the most disgusting one, beside the ones that I've mentioned, was a man that was requesting to be with a woman who had terminal cancer. There's nothing inherently wrong with being with someone or loving someone that has cancer, I have no issue with that, but he was treating it like a fetish. He listed on his profile that the sicker the better. Again, he also listed that he was willing to pay significant amounts of money or even take care of all medical costs for this person. This site cemented in my mind that there were some very, very disturbed people out there. I closed it and I shut down my laptop. I won't say it was the last time that I ever got on the deep web, but it definitely made me more careful about where I went, and much less curious about what was out there. This story goes back a few years. I don't recall the exact year, but it was probably between 2010 and 2011. I would have been around 20 because I was living with my parents, but attending night classes. It's not really important, but it does help to explain that I wasn't a kid at the time and, well, I should have known better. Anyways, like a lot of people that have an understanding of surface web versus deep web, I was dumb and curious. There was this one guy in one of my classes that was obviously a basement dweller. I'm not trying to be rude, he just looked the part. I'm not going to describe him, you know the stereotype, but let's just call him Jason. Jason was a bit antisocial, but he and I were decent friends due to our mutual interest in technology. I remember there was one night that class let out early. He and I went out to the lounge on campus and were talking about random tech stuff. He brought up the dark web, and at the time I wasn't really knowledgeable on what exactly it was. His explanation was pretty straightforward. It was a collection of sites and pages that were essentially hidden from the everyday user. And because of this, it was rife with illegal activity. At first, his explanation was enough to make me lose interest, but then he started showing me the pages that he used. He said the main one was basically a bulletin board like 4chan, but on steroids. He warned me that some of it was questionable, but there were sections where people would talk about philosophy, new technology, politics, and conspiracy theories. Now I'm a bit of a conspiracy nut. Not in that I believe in them, but I love to read them. And I love to pick apart what these people think. Obviously, some of them are completely insane, but there are some theories that are interesting and really do get you thinking. When Jason told me about this conspiracy board, it caught my attention. 
I told him that I wanted to get in on it, and he gave me a look that basically said, I don't think you should be doing this. I told him that I understood the risk, and that I would take any precautions that he suggested. I guess this was enough to convince him, and he gave me a list of things to do when I got home in order to get on the site. He then gave me the onion link to the page, and that was that. I went home, got on my desktop downstairs, and set up everything that he had said to set up. From there, I got on the bulletin and spent the entire night reading various conspiracy theories and paranormal explanations. Honestly, this was the highlight of my year. These were some of the craziest theories that I have ever read. After a few days, I started feeling a bit more comfortable and started commenting on posts. For the most part, I would prod for more information and people were shockingly respectful. I was genuinely surprised how straightforward the posts were. The people seemed almost decent, and most of them were fairly dismissive to the less than desirable theories out there ones that ended up being against certain races or religions. To be completely honest, this page felt more like a surface webpage. They were mostly respectful and open to discussion. The only reason I could think that this was a deep web site would be that they wanted a place to call their own and not get a ton of traffic. Then, it all went south. Fast. There was one post where the theorist started in on something interesting, but then immediately turned the entire theory into a pile of racist drivel. There weren't any comments on the post yet, so I decided to comment and be a bit of an ass to this guy. Maybe the anonymity had gotten to me, but I posted something like, Get your racist BS off the board, your kind isn't welcome here. It was a basic comment, but I was satisfied that others would back me up and this guy would get the hint and go away. After a few minutes, I went back to the post to see if there were any responses. No surprise, there was. I opened the thread, and there was only one comment from the original poster, and it said the following. F off, David. I was a bit shocked. My name is, in fact, David, but I had no idea how he could have known that. I started thinking back to whether or not I had maybe posted my name in another thread, if he'd somehow linked me to that post. I'd followed all of Jason's recommendations and covered my tracks in every way he had recommended. I decided to feign ignorance. I commented with, My name's not David. Nice try, though, douchebag. I think that was where I had made my biggest mistake. I shouldn't have challenged him. I should have ignored him and moved on. He replied within a few moments, Oh really? You're not David last name living with Carol and Larry last name at 1706 street name in Asheville, Virginia, attending college name and working part-time at my place of work? I was completely in awe. This person had completely gathered all of my personal information within a matter of a few minutes, and it was completely accurate. I was honestly sweating at the prospect of this dark web rando knowing exactly who I was and where I was. I decided I would comment one more time and just concede this conversation. I wrote, you win, I'll shut up, or something like that. There may have been more panic and begging in that comment. I went back after a few moments and noticed that his original comment was gone, and in its place was the following. Overwritten by Mod to David, I'll remove your information this time as a courtesy, but it's best to keep your mouth shut from now on. Also, get a better VPN. Your current one is leaking your IP information. Apparently, the VPN that Jason told me to use had a data leak of some sort, one that he wasn't aware of and one that gave away my actual location and registration information. I told Jason about what happened and he laughed at me. He told me it was basically my fault because I didn't do an IP check while connected to see if my information was hidden. He was right. That was part of his checklist. So that's my dark web story, and it's my only dark web story mostly because I never went back.
the story is going to be a bit technical, and I know that may turn some people off of it, but the technical side is important to know exactly what it is that made this such a weird situation for me. I'm going to try to keep it a bit simplified, so my apologies if the tech nerd in me breaks through. For some background on who I am, I do two jobs in my daily life. Front-end web development and back-end web connections. The first job has me building out websites for users and includes both the coding of the pages as well as the overall user interface. The second job has me watching server connections and seeing what traffic goes where and who connects to what. The best way to look at it is like this. If you connect to a website, you're connecting to a web server, most likely in a data center. Those data centers have routers internally, gateways, load balancers, which balance loads, and a bunch of other devices that most home users will never touch in their daily lives. And a lot of it is honestly really boring. And that said, most people know what a firewall is, or at least that it filters traffic based on rules. Those rules tell you what can and cannot connect, and what to do with traffic that isn't specifically laid out, accept or deny. All that technical BS out of the way, my job requires that I understand how connections happen, and that I need to know how to determine where an IP address is coming from. And this comes in handy, as I am able to see that an IP address in China is trying to connect to our local government website in Ohio, which typically results in those IPs getting blacklisted, basically pinpointing the geographical location of an IP address. It sounds complex, but I promise you, a lot of that information is very easily accessible, and with just a bit of know-how, you can usually get a good estimation on the location. Now that I'm done rambling, I've dabbled in the dark web a few times, and I like to know what I'm doing. Most of the time, connections on the deep web or dark web are encrypted, and it's difficult to find out who is where and what's all going on. Most of the time, the people that run dark web websites don't have much of a connection to the surface web, but it does occasionally happen. There was one time that I ended up on a deep web site that wasn't very well built, or at least not very well protected. This site was for Bitcoin transactions and money transfers, and based on what they described in their quote-unquote partner sites, they were used for very specific and very illegal adult content. You would like to think in your mind that they would keep these kinds of things behind good technology, and that you would never have to worry about your data being accessed. Well, you'd be very wrong in this case. The site itself had pieces of code that were static, including comments and connections to static IP addresses while checking out. Lesson 1 in security, never hardcode anything. Always code with dynamics in mind, and never reference your firewall in your programming. Anyways, I pulled what was listed as a static IP address in the connections, and there were only a couple of IPs. One of them seemed to not respond to any traffic at all, which I kind of expected to be the firewall. But the other one, the one that was constantly labeled as quote-unquote home throughout the code, seemed to be a web server, and then it wasn't locked down at all. I connected to the admin port on the server, and to my surprise, the login information was the default credentials. I was expecting the server to be mostly empty, maybe some kind of honeypot, but as I traversed the directories, I was honestly surprised. Looking at what was on the server, this was THE server the one that was running the payment processing for the illegal content, and they were storing all of the data on this server. Firewall lists, IP access logs that they were holding on to. There was a list of every IP and system that had connected and made transactions over the past year or two. As I dug deeper into the server, 
I found something that honestly creeped me out. There was a directory on the web server that was for a school district's website. This server that was taking payments for sites that ran very illegal content was also hosting the public surface web facing website for a school district. Looking at the information that was saved on some of the pages, it was a school district that taught everything from pre-K through 12th grade and was down south. I'm not going to list the specifics for the safety and security of the school. And my initial thought was maybe this server was hosted by a third party, maybe the school didn't actually own this server, but after checking the IP addresses on the geolocator, it was confirmed that this server was 100% hosted on a static IP address assigned to that school district. The schools probably had no idea that they were passing Bitcoin transactions for really vile content, but someone there knew and they were taking full advantage of having access to servers and having full access to a government funded and owned IP address. I gathered all the information I could, including how I found the server, what the server was hosting, and a very basic outline of the insecurities on the server. I also took screenshots of all the things that I knew existed. I bundled it all up and sent it over to the email of the superintendent of the district, advising them that they needed to look into who was managing and running their servers. I only ever got one email back basically saying thanks, and that they would look into it. My guess is, they either handed it over to the local police, or they did some sort of internal investigation. Obviously, they're not going to email me back to tell me the end results. But in my head, though, the sicko that was taking advantage of the schools like this is currently rotting in prison. I've only had one bad experience with the deep web, and it was way more than enough in my personal opinion. I'm not an overly technical person, I'm not a tech genius, I'm no hacker extraordinaire, but I do know my way around the internet, and I have an understanding of what indexing and non-indexed pages, deep web, actually are. I took a few classes on internet security and there were a couple of sections dedicated to the deep web and dark web, or at least explaining what they were, how the technology worked, like onion routing and encryption, and I felt confident enough to get on the deep web, and I thought I could keep myself safe. And that confidence was my first mistake. But in my defense, this situation could have happened on the surface web, it just made it that much creepier that it was on the deep web. Because I wasn't interested in any of the illegal content on the dark web, I kept myself confined to the part of the deep web that was closer to the surface. Basically, the waiting pool of the deep web. Of these pages, I mostly visited things like forums and discussion boards. I had this personal appreciation for anonymous conversation. And while I wasn't a troll or aggressive or anything, I was a bit more out with my opinion and personality, as there wasn't a name associated with the statement. Now, in order for this all to make sense, I kind of have to explain about what happened, and then go back to explain the how, because it won't really make sense otherwise. As stated, I spent a good amount of time on the forums. I spoke with people that I honestly considered my friends, and I learned a lot. It was actually kind of nice, kind of like there was a place that I belonged. <laughs> like a bar, but with text and random people that were faceless. Now, on the main forum that I would use, most people signed their posts and messages with a pseudonym. Of course, there was no control over this, 
and anyone could use anyone else's name on their post, and no one would ever be the wiser. Strangely enough, it was kind of an honor system, and most people followed it. My name on this site was, ironically, No Girls on the Net. It was supposed to be a joke, a play on the claim that there are no girls on the internet, just guys pretending to be girls. This was ironic because I was a girl. Anyways, on this forum, I was fairly well known to a lot of the people in my subboards, and people would refer to me as girl. I know, not exactly specific, but typically when someone typed girl, they were talking about me. Anyways, I was friends with a lot of people on this page, and they were all fairly decent. Never ran into anyone that I thought was really creepy, for the most part. That fell apart when I got a message on Facebook one day, of all places, from some guy that I had never seen before, named Derek. And that message just said, Hey girl. At first, I didn't put two and two together. I thought he was just being a douche, and I told him as such. My response was simply, what an incredibly rude and derogatory way to refer to someone. Give me one reason I should even bother responding to you beyond this. And this guy responds with, I thought that's what everyone called you. At least, that's what I've always called you. You're no girls on the net, right? When I read this, I was a bit freaked out. How had this person found my personal Facebook? There was absolutely no connection between me and that account, and I was always careful to not post anything that could be considered personally identifiable, and I had no idea how he had connected the dots. I asked who he was, and he once again asked if that was my username. I didn't want to tell him yes, but... I also didn't want to say anything that may indirectly confirm that it was me, so I ended up just saying that it wasn't me, and that I hoped he found whoever it was he was looking for. He responded with a smiley face, and then that was it for the conversation. I thought that was the end of it, I thought he had bought it, but I was wrong. I was very wrong. About a week later, I got a letter in the mail, and while this was a bit off, in today's day and age that is, I didn't think too much of it. I took it in, and I opened it, and then I pulled out the letter. It was a printed letter that pretty much just said, Don't lie to me, girl. I know it's you. I want to get to know you better. Here's my phone number. Shoot me a text when you get this. P.S. I will know that you got it. I was seriously freaked out. This guy was sending me letters, which meant that he knew my address. Not only that, but he claimed that he would somehow know if I got the letter and didn't tell him. How? That's when I looked over at the envelope to see if I could find a return address. And then I realized that, of course, there wasn't one. On top of that, there weren't any stamps on the envelope either, which meant that it hadn't gone through the post office. It was most likely hand-delivered, which then told me how he was going to know if I got it. My next mistake was calling the number. If I was going to fix this problem, I was going to have to do it head-on. I pulled out my phone, and I called him. When he answered... He started off with, Hey, sweetheart. I was legitimately disgusted. My response to him was, I'm not your sweetheart. I don't even know who the hell you are. How did you find my information? He avoided this question, but started saying that he was in love with me, and that he needed me in his life. I, once again, told him that I had no idea who he was and that I wasn't interested. He told me to get interested, or things were going to be difficult between us. 
I had had enough. I told him that he was a creep and that he needed to get a life, and then I hung up. He tried calling me back a couple times, but I ignored it. Then, he texted me, and I think I nearly pissed myself. The message that he sent me said, You're going to love me, one way or another. Don't make me hurt you. Which he then followed up with, See you later, sweetheart. Obviously, I was panicked. This dude was a super creep and had no issues with being creepy out in the open like this. But I really didn't have much in ways of options since he hadn't actually done anything. Being a creep isn't really a crime until or unless they escalate. Well, it escalated pretty quickly. It was actually that same night when things happened. Around 8 o'clock that evening, I heard a knock on my door. I unfortunately, knew it was most likely him. I pulled the curtain open from the side window, and I saw this guy standing there in a hooded sweatshirt and black pants. Pretty obvious red flag in this case. He stood there at the door and just kept knocking. Then he started yelling that he knew I was home. I stayed off to the side where he couldn't see me, and dialed 911 on my cell phone. When they asked what the emergency was, I said, loud enough for him to hear me, that there was some creep trying to break into my house, hoping that it would be enough to get him to go away. What I didn't expect was him to smash the glass of my front door with a hammer, and then reach in to unlock the door. What he didn't expect was my brother, a trained police officer, to come around the corner with his gun locked on him the second he stepped into the house. As soon as my brother screamed, get on the ground, this guy started yelling, don't shoot me, and fell to his knees. My brother restrained him, and the cops eventually showed up to arrest him. When they got him out and in their car, they came back to tell us what they had pulled off of him. This guy came with zip tie cuffs, a large knife, the hammer, obviously, and a pillowcase stuffed into the hoodie pocket. Basically, it was likely that he planned to kidnap me, cuff me, put the pillowcase over my head, and then take me out to his van, which he had parked just outside. In the van, they found condoms, adult toys, and various other creeper things that I don't really want to think about right now. So, that's the what, but the question becomes the how. How did he find me? How did he know who I was? How did he connect my stupid username with me as a person? Easy. I was an idiot. And apparently I had clicked a link that he posted onto the forum. This guy had linked to something on the forum page that I was apparently interested in, and it had malware that loaded onto my system because I had some stupid software, like JavaScript or Flash or something, that was out of date and vulnerable. And this guy was able to drop a keylogger onto my system. That, plus those fantastic little things in Chrome and Firefox that will save your personal information for quicker entry, Things like your address and name and all that. Yeah, that helped him tremendously. This guy had infected my system and I had, unbeknownst to me, given him all my personal information. Then he turned into the super creep. Like I said above, this technically could have happened on the surface web, but I think it was more likely to happen on the deep web forum because I had taken my anonymity for granted. I thought I was safe. I thought I was invincible, because my name was not connected to the board. Or the posts. So, I guess, take this as a lesson. Do not think that anonymity is invincibility. And make sure you always update your computer.
This happened a couple of years ago. I don't remember the exact month or year, but it couldn't have been more than just a few years ago because Bitcoin was at or near its peak. I used to spend a lot of time on the deep web, mostly on forums and things like that, but never on anything that was explicitly illegal. I know, that sounds incredibly convincing, right? Believe it or not, there are pages on the deep web that are good for entertainment. Some of them are in the gray area as far as ethics go, but again, not explicitly illegal. And some of them only become illegal if you take action on the page, I think. Look, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't really know. Anyway, I was browsing pages without intentions on actually doing anything on them. I was just perusing through random onion links to see what interesting stuff I could find. After checking out some random pages that sold things that were definitely not legal, I found a page that, well, again, was definitely not legal. From the start, on the page, I knew that this site was serious. The name of the page was something like L. H. Oswald Solutions, an obvious allusion to Lee Harvey Oswald, the man who assassinated JFK. Honestly, seeing that kind of made me chuckle. Something about using Oswald's name for the page was genuinely humorous. After reading their information, it was pretty clear why they had used that name. The entire page was meant for users to pay Bitcoin and hire a hitman. The page explained that they had top-tier men working for them, and price categories as well. The product started at intimidation and included things like arson, murder designed to look like a failed robbery, and had other tiers that were meant to make it look like an accident. The last one was the most expensive, obviously, and they gave scenarios on how they could make it happen, including hiking incidents, accidental drownings, and car troubles. Now, I had no intent on doing anything on this page other than reading what they had to say, mostly for personal entertainment. But then I got to the bottom of the main page. They had a full-on legal disclosure, which I thought was hilarious. It explained what actions you could take if they failed, and it laid out their personal guarantee that they could find anyone and everyone without fail. Immediately after this was a small note on the bottom. We can find anyone, and we can prove it. Click here for proof. Now, I know what you're thinking. No sane person would ever click that link, and no one could be so stupid as to click it intentionally. I didn't want to, but I had to. I had to know how they were going to guarantee that they could find anyone. So I clicked the button, and the page switched over to a plain black site with a smiley face and an hourglass icon that indicated it was loading. After a few seconds, the hourglass turned into a check mark. At first, I thought that was it. It was just going to sit there with a check mark and that was that. Then, much to my surprise, my cell phone started ringing. Obviously, I was freaking out inside, but I answered my phone anyway. I said hello. The voice on the other end was digitized, thankfully. It basically said, here's your proof, thank you for considering our services, a few times, and then hung up. I was actually grateful that it was a robocall and not a real person, but I was also terrified that it was able to find my number and call me. That was enough to tell me that they probably weren't screwing around and that I needed to never go to their website or question whether or not those Hitman sites are legit ever again. As has been stated in a number of other stories on the net about the dark web, if you don't have a reason to be on the dark web, then stay off. Obviously, I recommend understanding the technology, getting to know what a VPN is, understanding how Tor and encryption all work, 
but only for the sake of knowledge and an understanding of security. I'm all about understanding technology and really getting to know the layers of the internet, but don't go looking for illegal or questionable content. Because if you look, you will find it. That said, and moving on to the story that I wanted to share, and this happened several years ago. I would say early to mid-2000s at the latest. And this was a time before the internet was a huge entity that everyone spent all of their time on, when broadband was like 10 megabits per second at most, and Newgrounds was king of the internet. Back then, I was actually a contractor for web development. People and organizations that wanted to have their presence on the net would contact me and I would discuss what they wanted, then build websites for them. These weren't complex websites like what exists now. They were more like pages with static content and pictures. Basically just this is our company, and this is what we do, kind of pages. It was a good paying gig. Back in the early 2000s, a lot of companies wanted their presence on the web, and I worked with a lot of local corporations. It's not super relevant, but it helps to, one, let you know how old I am, and two, let you know that I understand technology and how the web works. Back then, I was always on the web, looking into competitor sites and seeing what worked where, and pulling inspiration from things that already existed. At one point, I was talking to a buddy of mine, another tech person, and he brought up that I should consider looking at the dark web for some inspiration. At first, I was a bit confused. The only thing I knew about the dark web was that it wasn't easy to get onto, and that it was where hackers and criminals hung out on the web. I asked him why he thought I should be going to the dark web, and he made a point that I couldn't refute. He mentioned that I would probably be the only person in the area that built websites that had seen parts of the dark web slash deep web. Basically. He was saying that I would have a leg up on everyone else, because I would have an idea that they wouldn't have. I kind of agreed with him, so after chatting with him, he convinced me and I had him come over to set up my system for accessing the dark web. I got on and started just going through random sites, and I was trying to avoid anything that could be illegal and I actually found a neat site that kind of worked like a wiki. I don't think it was the actual deep web wiki or anything like that, but it was a collection of links very similar to it, and some of them actually worked. For the most part, they just ended up on dead ends and nothing on the other side, but some of them were interesting forums and just pages with information about random things. I was happily clicking along when I came across a page that kind of looked like the original version of YouTube. If anyone has been around for a while, then you know what I mean. Old, blocky page with star ratings underneath the videos. What was weird to me was that a lot of the front page videos were just a black screen, and when I clicked on them, they had an overlay that said something along the lines of, this video has expired. What was strange to me was that the titles of the videos were just single words. The first one I clicked on was titled, Hang. There was another one that was called Electric, and one called Pain. Obviously, these were a bit ominous, but... There wasn't much on the screen for the videos, just the title and a star rating. Hang had a 5 star rating, and it showed that it had been rated 40 times, for instance. I was scrolling through the front page, and I finally found a video that didn't have a black box overlay. It was titled, 
shoot. The thumbnail for the video was a guy literally sitting in a nearly empty room that was trashed. I clicked the video and it started up pretty quick. I don't know why, but part of me was sitting there thinking it was going to be a fairly normal video. That it was going to be some sort of vlog or something from the guy in the thumbnail. Instead, what I got was a video of a guy sitting in this dingy looking room with a syringe in his hand. As much as I wanted to click away, I just sat there and watched this video as it played out. As the video started, he was just sitting there and staring at the camera. It looked like he nodded to someone that was behind the camera. After a second or two, the audio cut in, and I heard him say something like, For 300, right? And then a voice said yes. He nodded, and glanced back to the camera, and basically started stating his name and location. I don't remember exactly where he was, but he said his name was something like Jeff, that he was doing this for the site for an amount of money equal to $300, and that this video would serve as his contract. Then, he ended with a, And remember, kids, don't do drugs. Then, after a second, he situated himself in the chair and tied off part of his arm. Then he took the syringe and shoved it into his arm. Long story short, he shot whatever was in that syringe, I want to assume it was heroin, into his arm, and he was doing this on camera for money. My guess is that this site was set up for people to do things for the audiences, and then they would get paid for it. This was like some dark web sort of YouTube or Twitch for people to pay and watch what happened to other people in certain situations. Watching this guy have a reaction to the drugs that he put in his arm was horrifying. He seriously collapsed on the floor and he started convulsing, and I really don't want to remember the rest of it. I clicked off of it, and I went back to the main page. And at that point, the other videos became more clear. Hang, electrical, pain. All of these were videos of people doing something to themselves for payment. The fact that Hang had such a high rating really didn't sit well with me at this point. I can only imagine what happened on that video that got people to rate it five stars. After watching this guy drop to the floor from injecting, again, I'm assuming heroin, I wasn't very curious about the website anymore. I closed the page, and I decided that I was done with all of that. And honestly, the sight of that guy and the thought of what the other videos most likely contained has seriously haunted me ever since. I was 17 at the time of this event occurring. I was a nerdy and socially awkward teenager, so you can imagine the sort of crap that I did on the internet. I was at that perfect age to know my way around the internet, however I had a knack for hacking into things that were meant to be private. Social media and such, you know, the usual thing kids my age did. This was on a Saturday night when I had decided to try and up my hacking game, or so to speak. I just wanted to, no, I needed a challenge, which is when I stumbled onto the deep web. The deep web, it sounded pretty cool at the time, honestly it was the challenge that I had been looking for. I searched that stupid place for hours, my eyes absorbing everything that floated around the world wide web until... I found the one thing that would prove if I was actually good at being a hacker or not. Well, I proved myself wrong, nonetheless. 
when I hacked into a seemingly harmless bank account. Boy, was I wrong. I did my usual thing, my fingers rapidly tapping at the keyboard, all the weird encrypted symbols staring at me. I did everything the usual way, continued to type at the keyboard until, ping, I was in. I had finally hacked into the account after hours of failing. It was unbelievable to say the least. The person though, they didn't spend the money inside the account. Instead, it was immediately being sent somewhere else, and being the curious teenager I was, I decided to follow the electronic footprint until another box on my computer screen popped up. It was a completely different bank account, one that was across the country from the one I had just been in. If it was obvious by now where this is heading, then you might want to listen carefully because this was not in any way a fun experience for me. I quickly worked into hacking the new account, determined to figure out what the heck was going on with this, and much to my surprise, it led me to a page that I didn't even know existed. I really don't remember the website name, as this was such a long time ago, but this was one that you couldn't actually find if you searched on an engine like Google. This particular account was receiving money from across the country, and a few other places across the country. It took me hours to look through everything, and follow all the breadcrumbs, yet it wasn't until then that I had a great idea. Why not donate some of that money into the account of charities that could really use, and would use the money? I took a break from my computer, long enough to grab some dinner and go to the bathroom. The realization hit me when I got back to my room. I didn't know what person would be missing the money. It was clearly hidden in the deep web for a reason, so someone didn't want it to be found, or they were doing something illegal. I ended up doing a thorough search into the account. It looked like they were being paid a crap load of money for something. Something they were doing for a lot of different people across the world. I don't remember exactly how I was able to find out the account holder's name. The real thing I remember was that I was such a freaking sleuth. I did find the name, and I did a search on that person. Lord, it took forever, but it turned out that the second account that I had hacked into was some sort of bounty hunter, and not in the traditional sense. It was more like, uh, I guess you could say the person was some sort of hitman. Again, it was a long time ago. Trust me when I say that I immediately closed everything, found my way back out of the deep web, and shut my computer off for the night. I don't remember whether I had hidden my activity well enough. I don't remember if I even took the appropriate precautions, but I do know that I was terrified that the person would somehow figure out who I was and where I lived. I was afraid the person would come to my house or even my school just to murder me. I missed an entire week of school because I refused to even leave the house. And that wasn't my first time on the deep web, but it was definitely the last. The best advice I can give someone is to be careful when you're going that unfortunate rabbit hole. I'm sure it's exciting, but it can be very dangerous, and I'm not sure how all this really works nowadays. That experience scared me enough to stop any and all sorts of hacking. I couldn't stomach the fact that I may get killed over being too freaking curious. If you're absolutely certain that you want to go into the deep web, then please, please Take all the precautions to protect yourself and your family. I've been a user of the deep web for quite a long time, going through various deep sites and seeing what's out there. There are some interesting pages and people that exist, but if you don't know what you're doing, I really don't recommend getting involved in it. I've been in too deep for a while, and the story I'm about to tell you was at a time in my life where I was out of control and doing stupid things. Back in the day, I used to be one of those deep slash dark web users that may or may not have been involved in some questionable activity. Of this questionable activity, the worst was doing business with a website that was very similar to Silk Road. 
It wasn't Silk Road, but it was obviously trying to be. And as dumb as it sounds, the prices were more competitive than the others. Thinking back to it now, that should have been a red flag. The bigger sites had methods of vetting and verifications of their sellers. They knew who they were working with, and the security was definitely part of their pricing structure. But when you're a broke college kid that is addicted to certain medications, you don't really think too hard on the security of your dealer. Basically, your only thoughts are, do they have what I want, and can I afford it? So, obviously, I knew what I was doing back when I got involved with these sites and these people. I knew it was illegal, and I knew that I had no way of disputing if my dealer didn't come through, and I would have no manner of taking legal actions against the site or seller. The site had an interesting system in place. The sellers wouldn't list specifically what they had beyond a few cryptic user tags. And then they had what they called a traffic light system. Uh, basically, the seller could mark their stock based on color. Green was full, yellow limited, red was offline and not selling. If it was green, you could basically send them the money and get whatever you wanted. Yellow typically required a message to make sure they had what you wanted, and red meant, don't bother me. It was actually pretty damn smart. It cut out having to incriminate yourself by specifically listing what you had, and also cut down on the communication requirements. You just bought what you wanted, and moved on. In my time on this site, there was one user that I worked with regularly over the two years. They were dependable, and strangely enough, incredibly polite when I had messaged them. I know that may sound stupid, but they typically signed their messages with have a nice day and thank you for your business. Not really something you would expect from a person committed to doing something that was very obviously a felony. They were the only person I wanted to work with on this site and they always came through for me. In my time doing business with them, they had always been green or yellow. I couldn't recall once over the two years where they had switched over to red. Well, that is, until the last time I put an order in with them. I got on this site as normal and saw that he had marked himself as yellow. No big deal. I sent him a message, basically asking if my usual was available. Almost immediately after this, his page had switched over to red. I was a bit annoyed at this, as he'd always come through, and I was, as I said, an addict. I went over to his page and sent him another message that basically said, Hey man, what gives? Within a few moments, I got a message back that said, to put it kindly, F off. This came as an honest surprise to me. Like I said, he had always been so cordial before, I responded with something like, do you not want my money anymore? I waited for about an hour to see if he sent a message back, but I didn't get a response. It was a few days later that I went back to see if maybe he had stock again. I think part of me seriously thought that the seller was just having a bad day or maybe it was a partner of his that wasn't quite so polite. When I logged in, I saw that I had a message from him. I clicked it, and it said, I have your usual, send me the money. I was a bit wary at first. This was very direct and, again, not signed in his normal way. But I was also young and naive, and I needed the medication to keep my mind focused and study for exams. Despite my initial hesitation, I went ahead and sent him the money. I replied, told him that it was sent, and I waited. I think I messaged him once or twice after that within the week, but he had been offline since our last interaction and hadn't changed his account from Red. At first, I thought maybe he had just ripped me off, but about a week after that last interaction, I did get a package. The box looked like it was heavily used and trashy. This was in complete contrast from what I was used to. When I opened it, it was lacking pretty much all of the security the seller normally had. 
He would typically pack inconspicuous items in with the order, usually stuffed animals and toys. I'm assuming this was because they worked as both security in hiding the product and as padding. Instead, the box was full of packing peanuts and tissue paper. I dumped it out on the floor and checked it, thinking I was duped. But then I saw the pill bottle and an envelope with what appeared to be a letter. The first thing I did to satiate my curiosity was open the letter. It said, Consider this your last order. Jimmy is out of the trade. Thank you for your business. I was a little pissed off, since I was going to have to now find a new person on the site to work with. But at the same time, it wasn't a huge deal. I had about 60 days before that was going to be a problem. That was my thought until I grabbed the bottle and opened it. I removed the lid and saw that, instead of pills, inside the bottle were fingernails. I don't mean like fingernail clippings, I mean full fingernails that had been ripped out of the bedding of the finger, ten of them to be exact. The edges of them looked like they had dried blood, which told me that they had most likely been forcibly removed. It was then that the letter's meaning became a little bit more dark, with Jimmy being out of the trade. To answer any potential questions, I never went back to the site. I never went back to any drug site on the deep web at all. This scared me to the point that I pretty much abandoned all illegal activity. And to those that are curious, no, I did not go to the police. I wanted to. I wanted to tell them that it was possible that someone had been murdered, but how exactly does one explain that with what I had? I couldn't waltz into the precinct, slam a pill bottle full of fingernails down, and say, my drug dealer has been murdered. Technically, he could have pulled them out himself. Not likely, but possible. So anyways, that's my story. Stay off the dark web, deep web probably okay, but honestly just don't go near it. And don't do drugs, kids. The dark web is a place where you can buy damn near anything for the right amount of Bitcoin from things like the obvious, drugs, hacking tools, personal information on people you wish to stalk, all the way to things that are much more obscure. Things like exotic pets, hitman services, though most of those are honeypots, and illegally obtained weapons. Most of the time, when thinking about buying things on the dark web, it's best not to think too much on what you're looking at. Take it at face value and don't ask questions. You don't want to know where the hell those guys got that block of drugs or the handgun that you just purchased, because odds are, when you get to the end of that rabbit hole, you're going to find that Someone is either dead, injured, missing, or being looked for by federal agents. My point is, you really don't need to be on the dark web unless you plan to break the law in some way, shape, or form. That said, there is one service that I found on the dark web that actually made me think about it and what could have or could be happening. For a bit of backstory, I spend a lot of my personal time on the internet. I do a lot of contractor IT work for larger companies, mostly data security and security analysis for medium-sized corporations. One of my secondary jobs in my cybersecurity work is what is known as threat hunting. A threat hunter is someone that goes out onto the deep and dark web and tries to find pages that are selling vulnerability information for websites or technologies. Basically, they go and see if a company's information is readily available to hackers, or if they're using technologies that are being actively exploited. This doesn't have anything to do with my story, but it gives you an idea of who I am and what I do for a living. And 
It helps you to understand why I was out on the dark web. Now, because I had to find this data on the dark web, typically information that was for sale, I had to get in with the people selling the info, and I had to purchase it when necessary. These were legitimate sales on the dark web. Yes, this is a gray area, and yes, there can be issues with doing this, but a lot of the time, it was critical for what I was doing for these organizations. Because of this, I spent a lot of time on sites that were built to sell illegal content. This ties back to how I started the story. The sites that sell illegal content, items, and services, and typically you see these things and you just understand that they exist, and you move on. However, there was one site that had something that made me legitimately terrified. Mostly because it had two services that were sickeningly tied together. The first service that I saw was one that was, unfortunately, fairly common, which is escorts. A lot of the time, these escorts from the dark web are not willing participants. They are, more often than not, victims of human trafficking. That alone is sickening and terrible, but the next part is what made it worse. This website had a service dedicated to assisting immigrants. On its face, that may not sound like much, but put into context with the other side of that, it's incredibly likely that a lot of these immigrants they were helping were actually being dragged into the human trafficking side as well. I mean, just think about it. People entering a foreign country, possibly alone and desperate, most likely not able to keep in touch with family back home, and it's likely that no one knows where they're going to end up. I just kind of sat there and thought about it for a few moments, and it really got to me. The thoughts that someone from another country may be looking to get away from an, an oppressive government or away from something like the cartel could end up finding this as a way out. I could imagine they would do so much to scrape together the money just to pay these people that say they would help them. And then, they end up getting trafficked or sold out as an escort. I know this isn't your normal story, and I apologize if it's a bit strange in its context, but it's something I found on the dark web that actually scared me. And while it was really only an implication with no confirmation, it's one of those things that, when you know how these illegal networks work, it becomes quite clear what's happening. In the time that I have personally spent on the deep and dark web, which I can say with all honesty has probably been way too long, I've seen some incredibly bizarre and really messed up stuff. A lot of what I've seen and done could probably get me into legal trouble if I went into details. Thankfully, I know what I'm doing for the most part, and have protected myself. This isn't my first story on your channel, but I'm not going to say which other one was mine. I'll leave that for the listeners to figure out. I will say, in that story, the actions I took were definitely not legal. That said, I thought I would send you another story, and send you one that wasn't me doing anything, but me finding something on the deep web that was genuinely unexpected and legitimately creepy as hell. I can't remember the exact point in time when this happened, but it was a while back, pre-COVID, which honestly feels like an eternity ago. So, probably early 2019. I was on one of my typical dark web excursions, trying to decide what I wanted to do while perusing through various onion links. I ended up on a page that was 
incredibly out of place. On the dark web, you get tons of strange stuff, adult content and what have you, but this page looked like someone's personal homepage. It had a guy's picture on the front and center, and it went into a lot of detail explaining exactly who this guy was. It had his name, location, professional experiences, software and apps that he had developed, companies he had contracted with and worked for. To be honest, this page could almost have been a substitute for the guy's LinkedIn. You know, if it weren't an onion link on the deep web. I started reading his info out of curiosity. Honestly, I hadn't seen any other page where a person laid out their entire life for the dark web. But this guy was putting it all out there. Experience, education, who he's worked with, what programming languages he knew, all of it. I seriously went through all of his pages, one by one, pretty much becoming this guy's biggest fan. Until I got to the bottom. There was a page titled, To the Love of My Life, Chrissy. I was already this deep into this guy's information, so I figured why not learn about the person that he obviously was in love with. <laughs> Couldn't hurt, right? But before I press on about what this page was, I want to remind you that this page was laid out like a CV. This guy was very professional, and was obviously proud of his accomplishments. It had tons of his personal information, and it seriously looked like something he could have sent to a prospective employer. Uh, but this page undid all of that. At the top of the page, there was a brief explanation of who exactly Chrissy was. Apparently, Chrissy was a former co-worker with this guy that had worked together at a previous contract gig, and he was very obviously, painfully obsessed with her. The page had a header slash title that seriously read, Chrissy is my angel, my light, and God wants me to have her, which was then followed by an incredibly cringy poem about how she was his world and how his life was only worth living while he was with her. Then there was a picture of a woman who I'm going to go out on a limb and assume was Chrissy. Now, all of that was within the first section of the page, and it isn't too terrible, right? It is creepy, but it wasn't necessarily terrifying. Well, after that is where things started to get freaking weird. After his quick confession of how much he loved Chrissy, this guy threw out any semblance of sanity, and his mental state became very apparent. He had picture after picture after picture of this woman. Again, creepy. He was obviously collecting pictures of her, but it just kept escalating. Several of these pictures, in fact most of them, were pretty obviously taken without Chrissy's consent. Some looked like they were taken at company events or with friends. Some looked like they were taken from a Facebook page. But a lot of them were taken of her at candid moments. There were pictures of her at her desk in an office, in a parking lot, eating lunch with her friends, at a grocery store, and at a park with, I'm assuming, her husband and her kids. There were even some pictures taken of her through a window and through curtains of her in pajamas, and some others of her in her underwear in her bedroom. This guy was very clearly a stalker, which, yeah, was obvious, but he had taken it almost to the furthest level he could. By this point, we've clearly established here that this guy was obsessed, stalker, creep, but there's more. He had actually gone the length to photoshop Chrissy's face onto adult models, and then photoshopped his own face onto males in the same pictures. Each picture had its own description of what it was supposed to be, like, me and Chrissy on our honeymoon, a hot summer night, expressing our love, etc. And all of them were obviously photoshopped pictures of adult content with their faces, this man was obsessed, yes, 
which is creepy in its own rights, but this was a level above obsession. This was him living out a creepy fantasy with a woman that had a life of her own, and she had no idea how deep in love with her this weirdo was. I honestly felt bad for her. If I knew how to get a hold of her, I would have let her know so she could file a restraining order. I remember that after all the freaky pics, there was a section at the end that said something like, Chrissy and I are soulmates. We met in heaven before we came to earth, and God wants us to be together. We will be the modern Adam and Eve, lovers meant to usher in the future. She will see how much I love her, and we will embrace as we welcome our new lives. Which, to me, sounded a bit like he was going to force her to love him. But I don't know. In the end, this was one of the weirdest things I've seen on the dark web. It may not be super creepy to some people, but it does make me wonder how many weirdos obsess with their women coworkers like this and don't build their own deep web shrine. So I'm not a techie like some of the people here, but I at least do know what I need to do when it comes to accessing the deep web. That said, I don't go digging for creepy stuff, and I don't ever go for anything illegal. On the deep web, there is a lot of content that is just slightly too raunchy for the surface web, and isn't posted for the masses. A good number of deep web sites don't even crack the illegal category, and that's really the main difference between the deep web and the dark web. A lot of what I know on the deep web is people talking BS about random things. Things like politics, modern science, technology, cryptids, and other crazy supernatural stuff, as well as conspiracy theories. Some of those conspiracy theories can get really freaking weird. In fact, that's kind of what my story here is about. So, one of these sites that I would use a lot was basically a discussion board for conspiracy theories and craziness about how there were demons among us that were going to take over the world. A lot of it sounded like insane people just rambling off scripts that you would find in the trash bin at the Sci-Fi Channel headquarters, but some of it was interesting, and all of the theories had their ardent followers. The people that seemed to run most of the theories were those that genuinely believed that our government around the world was run by demons, and that they sacrificed children to drink their blood. Like, seriously crazy stuff. I remember that there was one user that I genuinely think was insane, and he was super into this theory. I think his tag was something like Dave is home, or something. I remember it being something about Dave and home, so I'm just going to call him Dave. Dave would post on every single thread that he could find, and he would egg on the initial poster to the point that he was almost rewriting their theories to be better. What's worse, he seemed to believe in every single crazy theory that was posted. Government run by baby-eating demons? Yep, yeah, totally true. Same government somehow being run by space-faring lizard people? Also just as true. Disney sneaking subtle hints into their kids' movies to get everyone hooked on cocaine? Sure, why the hell not? It was as if this guy refused to see reality for what was actually in front of his eyes. Everything had a hidden agenda. Everything was some plot to control the masses, and everything was worth questioning. I don't think Dave could have made a cup of coffee without accusing the coffee maker of trying to take away his God-given freedoms. Anyways, as quickly as I saw Dave pop up and make new posts on the forum, I noticed that he had almost completely disappeared. I went over to his profile to see what he had posted lately, only to find that he had made a final thread called, Don't Trust the Admins. This thread outlined that the admins of the forum site 
were attempting to find him and censor him so that they could send a hitman to take him out of the picture. It had a ton of seemingly irrelevant details, and included pictures of random people out walking that Dave claimed were following him for the admins. He then rounded the whole post out with an onion link to a website that he had created so that he could continue on with his ramblings. I went over to his website, and I read all of his posts, and they legitimately just kept getting crazier and crazier. Eventually, I'd had enough of his absolute insanity and decided to log off for a while. I kind of stopped getting into the deep web for a little bit, mostly because I didn't have the time. I was feeling the stress of the end of my first year in college. After a while, I think maybe it was about a couple months between my last login, I decided I wanted to go on and see what Dave had gotten up to. I went back to the forum, went to his account, and then to his personal site slash blog. When I got there, I found that there were over 300 new updates. This man had seriously posted over 300 times within a little over a month and a half, at most. I started down the rabbit hole of his posts, and his theories started getting really abstract. Some of them made some sense, like he would have clear moments in that crazy fog, but a lot of them were things like, the Russian government is watching you with a satellite that comes around every Thursday, and that meat you buy at the store isn't really meat, but a plasticine-like material that was synthesized in that it contained hormones to make people stupid. It was all honest-to-God insanity. Then, I got to the end of his feed, and I felt bad for laughing at his posts. His last post was simply titled, I can't do it anymore. It was probably the most lucid thing he had written on the page. It explained that his mother had passed away from cancer recently. Of course, he blamed Big Pharma for this, but then went on to explain that the stress of life was too much for him, and he couldn't keep up. He outlined some of his theories about the government running our lives and explained that if he couldn't live free, then he wouldn't live at all. He finished off the post by saying, to all my friends that have helped me see clearly over the years, I thank you, and may God bless you all. Then, he posted a picture of a hand holding a, a pistol of some sort. I don't know jack about guns, though. There was nothing after this post, and the few comments that existed were basically just people saying that God would understand his decision, and that he was truly a soldier fighting for the truth. Obviously, this was all pretty depressing, and I was a bit freaked out, knowing that this guy that I was just making fun of in my head was most likely no longer alive, and was also dealing with some very serious mental issues. In the end, I didn't really go back or spend any time on the deep web. Dave's story had a bit of a lasting effect on me, and kind of taught me a lesson about sympathy.